Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. Romans chapter 3, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is not going to be your typical Easter sermon. By my calculations, my insistence on sound biblical doctrine has ticked off about 1.3 billion Catholics, 1 billion Protestants, 5.2 billion people of various other religions, and about a half a billion atheists, and almost everyone on YouTube, as well as an innumerable host of demonic entities. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so thankful for the opportunity that you give us to come together and feast together on your word, filter out all that which is foolish, seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Romans 3.23, the righteousness of God is revealed separate from the law even the righteousness of God, which is by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe for all of them have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Don't stop reading. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Blessed Easter to everyone. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the resurrection of Christ. Man is totally depraved, suddenly redeemed freely, justified freely, without a cause, by the grace of God, through the faithfulness of Christ. Not our faith, not our works. An illustration of this is Abraham. The most common name in the New Testament is Abraham of all the names that God might have used in the New Testament. Abraham is more than any other, and that's astounding when you think about it. And the Holy Spirit uses Abraham as the great illustration of the faithfulness of God. We're talking about the faithfulness of God, not our faith here. It was God who called Abraham. Those whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate, and those whom he predestinated, he also called, and those whom he called, he justified. This is illustrated in Abraham. God foreknew him. God predestined him. God called him. And God made him righteous. And modern Christianity says, no, no, that's not true. Abraham made Abraham righteous by believing God. Dearly beloved, Abraham's belief in God was the testimony to the fact that he was righteous. We know that the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them. They that are in the flesh cannot be subject to the law of God. They cannot please God. The natural man cannot hear the Word of God. The natural man cannot come unto God. And the natural man cannot believe God. Why do you not believe my words, says Christ? Because you're not my sheep. Because you're not my sheep. 
Listen to me, folks. The fundamental requirement for believing God's Word is to be one of His sheep. And the great illustration of Abraham confirms this fact before there was ever, before there even existed a New Testament church. This is crucially important to our understanding of the Word. Verse 17 of that chapter, as it is written, he believed God. Verse 18, who against hope believed in hope, according to that which was spoken, again, the Word of God. He staggered not at the promise in the Word of God. Look at the emphasis on the Word of God. Being fully persuaded what God had promised, another in reference to the Word of God. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Okay, we're talking about the imputed righteousness of God. With all of that emphasis on the Word of God, it is astounding to me how little time and study is spent in this book. I have said this on numerous occasions. You should not go away from this message saying, you know, what, what Pastor Steve said. No matter what I say, what is supremely important is what God said. There isn't a single thing in your life, not a thing, that is as important as being able to hold in your hand and not only hold it, but to feast upon it, the Word of God. If you don't do anything else, just read it. And I'm certain that if an inventory were taken, the Word of God ranks very low in our list of priorities. Too many other things are more important. I find myself challenged in that area. Same as you. I won't study as long as there's an episode of Gunsmoke on TV. You might as well know it. Dearly beloved, this book is beyond precious. I covet the hours that I spend in this book. It's the Word of God. That's how you know peace and rest and joy because you know, you know the God of this book. Therefore, it was imputed to him. It's an aorist passive in verse 23. He had nothing to do with it. God did it. He didn't participate in the action. He did not initiate the action. God did it. It was imputed unto him toward righteousness or, or to righteousness so that you can see that Abraham is righteous. God made Abraham righteous. Abraham didn't make Abraham righteous. God made Abraham righteous, not because of anything that Abraham did. Genesis 15, 6. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Romans 4, 3. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Galatians 3, 6. So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. James 2, chapter 2, verse 23. And the Scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. I, God, chose Abraham alone. God chose him. You see the same thing in the Gospels when Christ comes to the pool of Bethesda with a great crowd there waiting to get into the troubled waters to be healed. To one man, he said, rise up, take up your bed and walk. Well, what about all the others that were there? Thousands, thousands of sermons preached on the compassion of Christ 
that he loved every man and he wants every man to be redeemed, he singled out one man from that crowd. One man. Dearly beloved, the entire thread of God's Word is His sovereign choice. You may not like that, but that is the fact of the matter. The most glaring truth in all the Word of God, and it's the most hated, and it's the most rejected. One of the most sobering and astounding facts in all, all of Scripture is that you, if you are a born-again believer in Christ, you stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. And I submit to you folks listening to this Easter message, the fact that God imputed His righteousness to everyone who believes is likely one of the most unfamiliar truths in the entire Christian's life justified 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 folks means made righteous dearly beloved you and i stand before him without spot as new creations in christ and romans 4 25 tells me that christ was raised because of our being made righteous our justification if our Heavenly Father had not considered the vicarious substitutionary death of His beloved Son in our place sufficient, Christ could not have risen from the dead. All of our sin was placed on Him and the very righteousness of God in Christ was imputed unto us. And as a result of that justification, Jesus Christ was able to rise from the dead. And we, were, we are able to celebrate Easter. He was able to rise from the dead. He was able to walk out of that tomb. It was not written for His sake alone that righteousness was imputed unto Him. This is your Easter message. It wasn't written until years after Abraham. Why was it written for us also? I mean, how do I delve into that? I mean, think of it, folks. In Abraham's day, God had you in mind when He dealt with Abraham and called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. And He said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. We also have an inheritance. Look at the spiritual connection here, relationship here. What we see of Abraham in the New Testament is like what we see in Lot. Sodom vexed Lot's righteous soul, and God sees us through Christ as righteous. There's not a, a single word about any of, of unfaithfulness in Abraham's life. When we see Him through Christ, He's a righteous man and God sees you as righteous. You have a sinful, sin, sinful old man, but you also have a sinless new nature. Don't miss the thread of the meaning here that you have peace with God. The gospel, the good news is that God has nothing against you. It wasn't written for His sake alone. It was written for you and I. We were in the mind of God before Time began. That's how important you are. That's how precious you are to God. When we look at the decrees and covenants, look at what God had purposed in Christ. That was us. You'll notice it wasn't written for everybody. One of the things that seems to make people the maddest is how dogmatic and how elective God is. There are sheep and there are goats. There are wheat and tare. There's the they and there's the us. It was written for us, says the text. wasn't written for them. It was written for us. 
Romans 5, 1. Therefore, being justified, made righteous, that's made righteous, by faith, His faith, the faithfulness of Christ, we have peace with God. The opposite of that is that those who aren't justified are at war with God. They are at war with God. The us are at peace with God. It was written for us. Now, if you have the authorized version, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on Him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. And once again, the conclusion is that all of this depends upon us. And that, of course, is most of modern Christianity. It depends on what you do. But dearly beloved, that is not biblical. Even if you accept this translation in the 24th verse of chapter 4, you would compare it Scripture with Scripture and say, well, I, well, I got to shift that around just a little bit. You are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. You do not, listen to me, dearly beloved, you do not believe because you're not my sheep. If you are my sheep, you, you would believe. Romans, or John chapter 10. John chapter 10. So we don't become a sheep based upon whether or not we believe. We believe based upon whether or not we're a sheep. Somehow or another, we turned it around. And we've got, we put the cart before the horse. In Colossians, how, how many people have wrestled with that passage of Scripture? Now are, you re now are ye reconciled if you continue in the faith. Now are you reconciled if you continue? What, what if you don't continue in the faith? Well, you must not be now reconciled. And yet the great emphasis today is that it depends on you. You've got to continue in the faith or you won't be reconciled. The fact that you continue in the faith is, is because you've been reconciled. It is a first-class condition in the Greek. You're reconciled now since you, can, since you continue in the faith. What God has done for you, folks, is absolutely certain. The results aren't tenuous. They're absolutely fixed. Therefore, it is by the faithfulness of Christ, not your faith, the faithfulness of Christ, in order that the promise might be absolutely certain to all the seed. And you say to the average Christian that every single one of God's children will be in heaven, and they get mad at you. Folks, I cannot imagine why anybody would get mad at that. I think it's, a, it's wonderful to know that all of God's children are going to be with Him. Romans 4, 24. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on Him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Folks, there is no conditional clause in verse 24. Those whom it is destined to be imputed, those who believe, that's a present participle, those believing on Him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. This is God's love letter to, to us, folks. There are no conditions put on grace, otherwise grace is no longer grace. Think about the grammar for a moment, because it's going to be important. We're going to look at two participles. Here's a present participle in verse 1 of chapter 5. It's an aorist passive participle. The present participle is concurrent with the main verb, so the believing and the imputing are simultaneous. When God makes one righteous, he's a believer. If one were not a believer, could he believe? Well, the answer has to be no. If a man's not a murderer, would he commit murder? No. What comes first? He has to be, this is the chicken, you know, 
or an egg kind of syndrome here. What, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Folks, what comes first? He has to be a murderer before he murders. He has to be a thief before he steals. If you say that this man is absolutely not a thief, he'll never steal. He can't steal unless he's a thief. He can't murder unless he's a murderer. He can't flee unless he's a hireling. And he can't believe unless he's a believer. And yet modern thought today seems to be that you become a believer by believing. You, you've got to be kidding. Folks, you don't do that in any other concept. You believe because you're a believer. Believing doesn't make you a believer. Us, those of us believing on Him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, you did not make yourself a believer. God did that. You are part of the us here. And you're part of the us before the beginning of time. Because we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Verse 25. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. It's... If you look at the Greek, it's because of our justification. Jesus our Lord was delivered, it's an aorist passive, for our offenses. Dia is the word, the Greek word dia, because of our offenses. You've got to stop and think about that for a moment. Okay, Christ did not come and willingly die in our place to put sand in Satan's mouth. He came and he died because of our offenses says the text. The first thing that you have to realize is that none of us were innocent. None of us were innocent. All had gone astray. We were totally depraved. We were guilty. Through Adam, sin entered the world system and death through sin, so death passed upon all men. That was God's judgment. It's astounding to me how many sermons I hear that are given to me to listen to that God commands you to do something, therefore you're able to do it. Well, you know, if, if you weren't able to do it, God wouldn't have commanded it. Folks, look at the Ten Commandments. Are you suggesting to me that Israel was able to keep those Ten Commandments? To love the Lord their God with all their heart and all their mind and all their strength? And their neighbor as their self, not only could they not love God that way, there's no way that they can love their neighbor that way. No way that they could have kept the law. Does God have the right to demand something that you can't do? Well, you take it up with Him. I think he absolutely has the right to do that. Why is a person responsible? Because somebody holds them responsible. That's all. Ability doesn't have one thing to do with responsibility. Not a bit. The only reason that you have any responsibility at all is because somebody holds you responsible. If there weren't a law, you know, a law giver holding you responsible, you can, well, you can drive any, any speed limit you want. I mean, you are only responsible to God because He holds you responsible. He was delivered for our offenses. There wasn't one of us that wasn't guilty. There wasn't one of us who could say that they hadn't sinned. And it was our offenses that caused Him, Christ Jesus, to be delivered. And He was raised again, and again, it's dia, because of, He was raised because of our being made righteous. If those believing were not made the righteousness of God in Christ, if we had not been justified, that is, made righteous, fully righteous, as righteous as His Son, 
Christ could not have risen from the dead and we wouldn't have an Easter. And what's astounding about that is the fact that so few believing in Him this Easter know that they've been made righteous, as, as righteous as Jesus Christ Himself. You can't get any more righteous than that. This is the ground that God has placed us to walk on. Resurrection ground. It seems to me that we are treading on very holy ground. I repeat this again because I believe it is important. This Easter, I am sure that there were a hundred thousand sermons you know, preached on, well, Christ revealed His manhood when He shrunk from the cross and He prayed that if it'd be possible that He'd get out of dying on the cross. Never prayed such a thing. If Christ prayed that which He knew not to be the Father's will, then He sinned. And you've got some serious theological problems. You can say, nevertheless thy will be done because you don't know the Father's will. But for you to tell me that Christ did not know that it was the Father's will that He come and die in our place would be a charade. Of course He did. And to ask to get out of, out of it would be sin. And, and if He sinned, He's not my Savior. But the Word says that He offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. Hebrews 5, 7. And he was heard in that he was delivered. Delivered from what? Delivered from what? He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. Not everyone, once again, is for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And now He, the perfect incarnate Son of God, was made to be sin. Well, what happened to that sin? My Lord and Savior was made sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God. How righteous is that, you think? He was made sin. He was heard in that He rose from the dead and He became the author of eternal salvation, having been made perfect, complete. In Timothy, we are told that He was justified in the Spirit. Well, why does Christ have to be justified? Because He was made sin for us. And God Almighty saw the travail of His soul and was satisfied and somehow, somehow in the realms of glory that I cannot fathom, the one who was made sin was delivered. God saw the travail of His soul and was satisfied. And it was a sufficient price. Nothing to be added. Complete. Satisfactory. And because it was a sufficient price, He was raised from the dead. It doesn't seem to matter, uh, matter. It doesn't seem to matter to modern Christianity. It doesn't seem to matter to modern Christianity whether He rose from the dead or not. I mean, what, what is... What is Christianity and modern thought? Well, it's taking care of the poor and the hungry. It's, it's loving one another. And it's, ta it's taking covered dishes to the neighbor when they, they have a, a problem. It's giving to the poor and it's, it's sending some money to missions. And, and it doesn't matter whether Christ ever lived or died or rose again. No, Pastor Steve, what's really important is do we love one another? Well, I think it's wonderful to love one another. But what's really important is did Jesus Christ die in my place that I might be made the righteousness of God in Him? And was that death a sufficient price? If He did not rise from the dead, I am of all men most to be pitied. I'm told in Corinthians, 
it is, it is crucially important that Jesus Christ became my kinsman, Redeemer. It is crucially important that He paid the price that I could not pay. It is crucially important that He rose from the dead. He was delivered because of my sins and the price He paid made me righteous. That's what made me righteous. God can't declare someone righteous that He doesn't make righteous. He made you righteous. He declared you righteous. And because that price was sufficient, He rose from the dead. If He had not risen from the dead, that's tantamount to saying that the price paid was not enough. It, wasn't, it was insufficient. Praise God that He rose from the dead or I would not stand before Him righteous, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Not because I did anything. Not because I earned that. But because of everything that Jesus Christ did. And the result of that, dearly beloved, the result of that is what Christians need. They lack so much today. And that is peace with God. Peace with God. Read the Young's literal translation. Who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised up because of our being declared righteous. That's Easter, folks. All right. Romans 4.25. We're studying through Philemon on, on Sundays normally, but this Easter got that interrupted. We're in verse 2. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Philemon 1.2. This kind of just sort of fits right into this. Well, grace and peace, folks. I, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Know what He's done for you. This Easter, blessed Easter from all of us here at blessedhopeforever.com.